Uh, hello and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us for our intro to the OSF or OSF 101, Supporting Solutions Across the Open Research Lifecycle. My name is Daniel Steger. I'm the engagement lead at, uh, for our OSF product team. Now, this webinar will have a little bit of a unique format. We're going to start with a presentation section and a series of short videos for roughly about 25 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. Because this is an introductory webinar, uh, we will expect a lot of questions. So the OSF product team is standing by in the chat to answer any questions that come in. So please send your questions to the Q&A section uh, for this webinar. I will also help de uh, demonstrate any outstanding questions at the end of this presentation in the Q&A session. The goal of this webinar is to provide new and experienced users a chance to understand the OSF and all the tools of the OSF. Now, traditionally, an introduction to the OSF starts with us explaining each of the tools and services that the OSF provides. But for this webinar, we're gonna take a little bit of a different perspective, yours. In front of us is a diagram depicting the research life cycle or a series of steps that researchers follow from the conception of an idea to publication. Our intention with this webinar is to start with almost universal problems that all researchers face throughout the research life cycle and demonstrate how the OSF is designed to support you in facing them. To help explain these problems, we'll be telling the story through a fictitious researcher named Sophia. At each stage, we'll talk about these common problems before watching a short video from Sophia's perspective. Along with myself, other members of our product team have narrated these short videos to help you understand the ways in which the OSF can help Sophia and yourself follow open science practices at each step of your research journey. So let's start where all stories begin. An introduction to Sophia. Well, let's watch how she begins her open science research journey using the OSF. Meet Sophia. She's an early career researcher who is well versed in her field. Sophia believes that all aspects of scientific research should be transparent and reproducible that all steps in the research life cycle are valuable, that a well-crafted hypothesis, protocol, or data collection is still important even when an experiment didn't go as planned. Upon exploring these ideals, she came across the term open science, but isn't sure how she can put these concepts into practice. Through conversations with her colleagues, she learns about a research management tool called Open Science Framework, or OSF. Admittedly, Sophia was excited but a bit nervous. Following open science guidelines feels like an intimidating undertaking, and she has many questions about where to begin. The OSF is an online platform that enables researchers to transparently plan, collect, analyze, and share their work throughout the entire research lifecycle. Each tool on the OSF is specifically designed to promote the integrity of research while supporting a researcher's individual comfort levels related to sharing and collaboration. Because of its focus on research integrity, the OSF has caught the attention of institutions with open access policies, publication journals, and even funding agencies, both private or government. Let's follow Sophia as she explores and learns how some of her very common problems in research can be addressed by the tools available to her for free on the OSF. So now that we've met Sophia, let's follow her to her first story. Sophia, like most researchers do, begins in the discovery phase of the research life cycle. This is normally filled with research and long hours of reading lots of new, uh, new literature. Starting with a new study can be an uncertain time for researchers. Common questions that they often ask themselves are, how do I know if my idea is new? Where should I look? Has someone already done my research idea? And if yes, can I build off of their findings? So let's see what happens when Sophia has access to not only published articles, but all of the material that's shared on the OSF. 
Sophia, like most researchers, is always brainstorming new ideas for studies that can contribute to her field in exciting ways. Before a new idea takes shape, she evaluates the research landscape to see what is being investigated recently. Traditionally, she has always used reference platforms or specific journals, but many publications can have out-of-date results and often only provide information regarding successful studies. What if another researcher had tried her new idea, but it didn't produce the expected outcome? How can the scientific community learn from their mistakes if they only share perfect, expected results? Sophia heard about the Open Science Framework again, or OSF, recently at a presentation hosted by her university's library research services. Curiosity piqued, Sophia decides to take a look through the OSF to see what others in her field are working on. Her goal? To verify that an idea she has for a new study is not being done elsewhere, or if it is, to learn from their results. Through her search on the OSF, Sophia is surprised not only to find pre-publication manuscripts, but also countless cutting-edge research protocols, collected data, and analyses related to her research interest. Since these other researchers have shared their work on the OSF, she is now able to build off of their study ideas from all stages of research. Sophia is reassured that her research idea is unique and untested. All materials shared on the OSF open the door for new potential collaborations on future projects. So Sophia was able to take all the materials available to her on the OSF and develop a new and unique study plan. So once a researcher has a study plan, they're faced with a daunting question, especially if they're looking to follow open science practices. How do they document and share their research plan while remaining transparent to, research, to the research community? It's at this phase that you may also come across common terms like registration or pre-registration. What is that? And how can it promote transparency? I'm gonna actually pass the mic to one of our uh, product owners, Gretchen, uh, who will help explain uh, how Sophia was able to answer these questions about her research plan in this short video. Now that Sophia has a good idea for a research project, she wants to begin to design a study and start collecting any materials she might need. While searching for an idea, she was able to see firsthand how valuable it is to share your research plan for not only the credibility of the researcher, but the benefit of the scientific community. She's excited to take her first step in open science practices and recognizes that the research plans she found are called pre-registrations. In order to be as transparent as possible and to document her idea for future reference, Sophia decides to start to put together a pre-registration in the OSF. In her pre-registration, Sophia tells the story of her study, including her research questions, protocols, and data collection plans, as well as adding any materials or collaborators. Once Sophia finalizes her plan and creates a pre-registration, it's time stamped with a permanent digital object identifier, or DOI, for future reference, and it's archived for permanent storage. The registration is therefore a centralized point of reference for anyone interested in finding out about Sophia's study and can even link to the study's files and other resources. Creating a registration before she begins the project helps Sophia if she decides to seek funding from funding agencies that require open science practices. Sophia has heard many stories about research ideas being stolen or scooped. If Sophia is worried about sharing her work or registration while it's still in progress, she can also embargo access or temporarily make her registration private for up to four years. While embargoed, Sophia can create an anonymized view-only link for sharing with potential reviewers or funders. Sophia is confident in her registered study plan, but things can change. If she does need to make an amendment to her study plan, she can create an update to her registration. Any changes are recorded with a descriptive summary of each. This allows Sophia to create a clear story for other researchers to follow her registration from original concept to current version.
So now that Sophia has developed an initial plan and created and submitted her pre-registration, let's continue on to the next story to see how she can use the OSF to better work with her research team. Researchers, while conducting a study, often don't complete the study all by themselves. Uh, more times than not, they're working in teams. Now, these teams could be interdepartmental with a primary investigator and their graduate students, or they could be collaborators across universities or institutions. Regardless, common problems often come up. How can I collect my data and share it with my collaborators, making sure that everyone has access to the most recent version of our findings? Blaine, another one of our product owners, will explain how Sophia was able to create a centralized workspace that will help benefit her and her research team as she implements her research plan. Sophia has explored the landscape within her field and come up with a great research idea and registered it on the OSF. She has been working with a few of her colleagues throughout the process, but in the past, she's had problems with collaborations outside her institution. There always seems to be difficulties associated with access to the study's current data and any changes to methods or protocols that occur during the project. Research institutions often provide different storage options to their researchers, making it difficult to collect all of the data from collaborators in one place. Sophia envisions setting up a hub where she and her collaborators and any other research lab partners can easily upload and share the data generated during the study. To facilitate this transition to an open, transparent base, OSF automatically created a project space for her when she created her pre-registration. Sophia uses her OSF project as a central collaborative space that allows her team to store and share materials and manage their study throughout the entire research life cycle. Sophia notices that projects can be made public or private at any time and access to the project can be given to her external stakeholders or restricted to just her team. In contrast to the pre-registration Sophia created, which is more like a snapshot of her study frozen in time, her OSF project is like a sandbox where work is constantly ongoing. Materials are easily stored, findable, and editable, and recent activity can be tracked by all team members. Sophia is able to integrate her OSF project space into a variety of common external storage providers for uploading data, code, images, or even videos associated with her research project. This means that all files from Sophia and her team on their preferred storage providers can be aggregated together on her OSF project without having to re-upload each file. Each of these files from external storage providers can still be rendered on her OSF project. Sophia uses the wiki section on her project as a bulletin board. She's able to coordinate with her team members, leaving messages about objectives, plans, and making sure everyone is on the same page throughout the entire project. All of Sophia and her team's activities on the project are included in an activity log, tracking the various changes to files and organization. Any changes to her project space do not affect her initial pre-registration. As Sophia's study grows, she creates a directory of materials in her OSF project by creating subprojects or components, Sophia is now able to create as many components or new OSF projects as she needs for her study. With her centralized OSF project workspace, uh, Sophia completes her, re uh, her research project and starts writing a manuscript. Going back to the research life cycle. Uh, she now faces a common problem that researchers have encountered. How and where can I share my findings? Sometimes researchers have no shortage of publisher options, but would like to quickly share their funding, uh, their findings without having to wait through the long publication process. On the other hand, maybe there's a lack of interest from traditional publishers. Regardless, Sophia Let's follow Sophia as Eric, our product manager, explains how Sophia could use the OSF preprints to share her work. 
Now that Sophia and her team have completed the analysis for their study, she is excited to share her fresh new manuscript with others in her community. Sophia's preprint receives its own permanent DOI and is indexed by other discovery services on the web. She can update her preprint at any time to include new information, and all versions are available for readers. Following open science practices, she makes the entirety of the study's lifecycle clear. Sophia adds links to her OSF project and her pre-registration, as well as links to any subsequent publications, making all of the steps of her research project available together. The preprint, as with the other resources she has developed on the OSF, reveals the relationship between her paper, her team, her analysis, her research plan, her institution, and herself. Sophia has completed her research project and shared it using the OSF preprints. Now, you may be in the audience thinking, we've reached the end of the research lifecycle. What else is there to talk about? Well, most researchers work through some sort of university or research institution. Researchers often also require funding from public or private funding agencies. Because of this, researchers face reporting requirements. So common questions include, how does my institution or funder know that I've actually published my study? Along with common questions that occur at the end of the research life cycle, like, what do I do next? So let's have Mark, a product owner on our team, talk us through how Sophia was able to address these requirements and questions on reporting about the OSF. With the closing of her study, Sophia is in an interesting position in their research life cycle. She is promoting the discoverability of her concluded study while keeping an eye out for her next idea. She is also looking to comply with any requirements from her funder and institution open science reporting requirements. The agency that provided the funding for the study requires that Sophia report back on her project and show that the appropriate data and findings are openly available. From the funder's perspective, the goal is to make sure that a completed study is accessible and persistently available to the scientific community. In addition to Sophia's funding requirements, the institution that employs Sophia asks for reports of her annual research activity. Both of these common problems can be easily solved because Sophia used OSF to manage her study and publicize her results. Sophia can share the permanent DOI to her preprint directly stored on the OSF. Alternatively, she can search through the preprint repository or Google Scholar if she doesn't have the DOI readily available. She is also able to provide the DOIs for her public registration and project. The OSF provides her with analytics including the numbers of downloads and views on her preprint, registration, and project to be able to report as required. Sophia's registration and materials in her OSF project are linked from the preprint and vice versa, helping make the full story of her research study available online. Her institution can find the preprint on the OSF preprint repository or through Google Scholar. Sophia's institution also has a OSF institution's membership, so all public material including Sophia's study, is aggregated and shared on their dashboard. Because of this, Sophia's work is getting noticed even at her own institution, as her colleagues down the hall congratulate her on her new publication. Now that Sophia has successfully finished, she is eager to go back and get started on her next study, which was inspired by some of her findings. She starts her new project off as she did the previous one, with a search of OSF to see what other researchers in her field are up to. So taking one final step, this time a little bit away from the research life cycle, most members of this audience are either new to the OSF or looking to learn more. In these situations, you're likely to have questions. So let's check in with Sophia one last time to see how she's able to answer her questions using the OSF. Sophia can now use the OSF to support her research goals, but like anyone who's trying something new, she has more questions. 
she ever has a question or experiences a problem, she can go to our OSF Support Center. Here she finds an extensive set of help guides and resources to help answer her questions. Sections of the Support Center correspond to sections of the OSF, including help guides on registrations, preprints, projects, and even information for her account. Additionally, she finds a Getting Started section for new users, frequently asked questions, and even translated resources in other languages. Sophia has a specific question, but isn't sure what section of the Support Center it would fall under. She decides to utilize the search bar at the top, which aggregates the help guide results based on keywords from the question. Normally, this helps her find her answer, but no luck this time. If she can't find an answer to her question, Sophia knows that she can always ask customer support for help, where she will receive a message from a dedicated staff member trained in all aspects of the OSF. The Help Center is a valuable resource, and Sophia returns regularly as she continues to learn about the OSF. Now, as we close the presentation portion of this webinar, we return to look at a research life cycle. Regardless of what step of the research life cycle you're currently on, the OSF, the OSF has tools designed specifically to support you as a researcher. Do you ever have any questions about how to improve uh, if you ever have any questions or even ideas to improve the OSF, please contact myself or any member of the product team. We're always looking for ways to better fit the OSF to your needs. Uh, thank you for coming with us on this exciting journey and to watch Sophia learn about the OSF and open science. Uh, we hope this encourages you to think about open and transparent practices and how scientific community at large can benefit from these ideas. At this time, we're gonna transition over to our Q&A session. Now, I've seen quite a few questions come in through our Q&A chat and our product team has been working through them. Uh, but another thing that I wanna suggest is that we ran through a lot of these features on the OSF pretty quickly. If you do have a feature that you would like to see uh, me demonstrate a little bit more on, please put that in the chat as well and I can talk through some of those things. So I'm gonna start with some of the questions that I've seen come in uh, and I'm gonna transition over to some of our uh, pre-made things from Sophia's projects. Now, scrolling through, I'm going to look at some of the questions. And uh, first one to see, uh, can you say more about the resources feature? Uh, the resources feature is actually a really interesting feature on registrations. Now, if you've missed this one, no worries. It actually came out uh, last night. Uh, if you go on to any of your registrations or existing registrations, you'll see this little pop-up here. Uh, it says resources. Resources is a really interesting thing that we've added where you can now add files or data or any sort of analytics that actually occur after a registration has been made. So if you've collected data or anything that's actually after the registration has been archived and planned, and you actually conduct your study, you have a way of linking those DOIs back to our resources. Now, these DOIs that are actually here, remember a DOI is a persistent link um, that's protected so that it doesn't actually break long-term down the line. Uh, these DOIs can be found in multiple different places. Uh, if you have any questions on that, you can look at our uh, registrations files help guide. That'll definitely help you uh, figure out exactly how you can link back some of your resources. Looking through, uh, does OSF store all file types? That's a good one. Uh, I'm gonna go over to here. Uh, OSF does store most file types and you can see a lot of them um, quickly as we kind of scan through here. Uh, we have a GitHub repository um, a GitHub add-on uh, that's actually connected to the OSF. So you do see quite a few different file types that can render on the OSF. Um, if you do have a file type that doesn't end up rendering on the OSF, uh, there's a potential bug or it might not actually render. And we can actually take that in as a feature request, something that we can use to improve the OSF in the future. 
and you can kind of scan through some of these as we go through as well. Uh, looking through, uh, sometimes I need to do an anonymous review uh, for peer review process. That is a really, really good question. Um, we touched on it pretty quickly in the video, uh, but specifically, if you have, say, a private project, like this one actually is on the OSF, um, I can make this project public or private at any time. Uh, currently, this one is public, but I'm actually going to shift it over to private because I want to. Uh, changing it over to private now hides this from anyone that's not a contributor on this project. Now, what I can do is say I do have to send my information, my project or my registration out to a funder or a, uh, a peer review process. Uh, one of the things I can do is I can go to the contributor section here. And I can do what is called a view only link. Now, this is a link that I can create that is very specific to just our project. So it doesn't open up the project to everyone in the world, but anyone that has that link has a chance to look at it. We also have the option of anonymizing this link, which means that on the registration template or the project template, uh, it will take away anything that will identify me or my contributors as being the people who are actually working on this project. Uh, all I would need to do is click anonymize and then create this link. Now I could take this test link and send it to anyone that I want. Uh, and that's something similar that can be done with registrations as well. The only links. Okay, scrolling through. Lately, funders are requiring compliance. How does the OSF help me with that? Uh, the OSF helps you with compliance in a few different ways. Uh, you may have also seen a uh, recent news, uh, especially if you're in the United States, uh, public funders uh, now require uh, persistent identifiers, persistent uh, information for your data that you're collecting as part of a uh, government grant. Now, one of the things that the OSF does is you can, if it is a public project or a public registration or a preprint, uh, it has a DOI. Um, these are persistent identifiers that can help you share and maintain your data. We also have a data management section, uh, which can help you organize your data in a more persistent way. Um, that is also in our help section, so you can check out some of those resources whenever you get the chance. Uh, scrolling through here, we have some more questions. Got that some in the, in the active Q&A, Daniel, that we can talk Awesome, about. awesome. Thank you, Eric. Um, I'm guessing the ones that you have, uh, Eric Olson is going to answer this question live. You mean me? Or yeah. you? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, are these slides, are the slides available on the OSF? I'm guessing that means the slides from our presentation. Um, well, the goal of this webinar is to actually take that presentation section uh, and make it available for all places. Uh, we're planning on posting that uh, in a couple of different places like our welcome email. Uh, so when you create a new account, you would have that video, uh, but we're also gonna make that available in our help center uh, because hopefully it's a good resource, especially for uh, new users and really for established users if you wanna convince someone to join the OSF. Uh, what are recommendations do you have for uploading a preprint then sending the manuscript to a peer reviewed journal. Is it possible to upload an anonymized version of a preprint? Uh, unfortunately, no. Uh, preprints as they go up are public. That's ideally what happens is as soon as you post a preprint, uh, it's actually public. Uh, so especially if you're going to be submitting to a peer reviewed journal, I would check in with your uh, journals requirements. Some journals do allow you to post a preprint version of that manuscript as it goes up, especially saying that it does allow you to be a little bit more flexible, uh, especially with uh, manuscript requirements. They often are constraining in you know, character limits and different 
templates and things like that. Whereas an OSF preprint, you can upload any file type you want. It can be as long as you want. So you can really tell your narrative in your story, but that doesn't necessarily mean that every journal and every publisher allows you to do that. So I would go back, make sure that you're checking in with their requirements. Um, because as you said here, uh, there, there actually is not a way to make a preprint private prior to making it released. Scrolling through, how does institutional membership on the OSF work? Is it different from institutional repositories? Uh, is there an institutional membership fee? Uh, institutional, um, OSF institution is actually a paid service on the OSF. Uh, it's a really useful service, but it's something that a institution or a university uh, will work with us on and we'll actually create a way for these institutions to aggregate all of their public material in one place. Uh, these institutions, as the video said, get a lot of metrics on this, a lot of analytics that show how often are people actually you know, using and publishing on the OSF. But as we also said in the video, it's a really great way for coordinating between departments, which is invaluable at a time right now when a lot of people are working remotely. Uh, you're able to see what public things have been posted by your colleagues down the hall. So not only are you getting to collaborate and work and network, but you're also showing what you're doing. So there may not be repeated level of work, especially in departments that have similar types of research. Uh, there is a fee associated with uh, OSF institutions. Uh, if you have any questions on that, you can contact myself or uh, Eric, who popped on every once in a while. Um, but we'll have a meeting and we could talk a little bit more about what those fees entail. Uh, can you talk about writing in the wiki? Uh, some key formats in the Markdown languages. Yeah, uh, so we mentioned this quickly in the video. Again, um, I have it actually up here. Uh, here's one of the wikis for Sophia's work. Uh, wikis are pretty open-ended, especially in the way that they are able to be worked. Uh, it's essentially a giant text file where you can go through and you can create versions of a wiki. Now, anytime someone makes a edit to a wiki, it actually creates a version. So you can see going back in time, say I make a change here to Sophia's wiki. I will save this and we can actually see the current version versus Sophia's original version that does not have my changes to it. Make changes here. Uh, these are extremely flexible. Now I've seen users who are teaching their university course through the OSF and teaching people how to use the institutions, they will use this wiki section as almost a syllabus or a message board that says, uh, homework's due on Friday, uh, or make sure that you have this project done and here's a timetable of when it needs to be done. Uh, it's a really great flexible way for you to coordinate between team members. Uh, it's also an invaluable tool if you are a researcher working with universities or collaborators that are you know, across the world, across the country. Uh, this is a great way to say, hey, I was working on this. This is what we're doing today. This is the goal of today. Here's what we got. Um, it's just a very quick way of making sure everything's in one place and you're not coordinating between either emails or anything along those lines. Uh, da, 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 da. Keep scrolling through. Um, Is there any support for, oh, looks like Eric's answering that question. Uh, talk more about, get I can also look at some of the answered ones, Daniel. Yeah, that's, that's a good that, idea. There might be something to, to yeah. show or demonstrate. I didn't get to see many of these come in. Eric, did you have one in mind that may be good for a demonstration? Ooh, we could talk more about the add-ons. I saw that. Um, now, this isn't a direct question. My institution works with Figshare. Uh, I can find the documentation on how OSF and Figshare uh, can and cannot interact. 
That's a great question. Uh, Figshare would be considered one of our add-ons. Uh, add-ons are a way for the OSF to not have to do everything and repeat everything. So if your institution, say, has a Figshare uh, subscription or a Google Drive subscription or a Box subscription, any storage uh, provider, uh, you can actually connect that directly to your OSF project. Um, one of the things that you can do, so say here is Figshare, um, you will see the Figshare logo, Figshare, whatever, uh, and you can actually enable this interaction. Um, along with different storage providers, we have uh, providers for um, different citation software. Uh, we have uh, all sorts of different things. So this is a really great place for you to go through and explore, um, especially if you're worried about um, storage requirements or storage cap limits. Uh, this is a really great place to kind of get around those things, but also not really have to change your file structure that you've already been working on for years. Um, this just gives you a way of creating that centralized workspace uh, that Sophia kind of showed us how to do. Um, I'm not going to get into what each individual uh, add-on will allow you to do versus not allow you to do, uh, but we do put up a, a function and a status uh, idea here where you're able to go through and kind of see exactly how these add-ons interact within the OSF. The good thing is that if I go, I'm going to use, uh, I believe we have, yep, uh, GitHub set up here. Um, but if you have a GitHub repository, I'm able to look at some of these files directly on the OSF without actually having to go back into um, GitHub every single time I need to use it. Now, a lot of times you're not able to edit these things directly in here, but you can go into GitHub, make your changes, and that'll reflect directly in the centralized workspace. Uh, meaning that if your collaborator see, uh, you're working with a collaborator and they make a change on their file, you'll be able to see it on the OSF without actually having to go to their GitHub file to actually make that change. Uh, scrolling back in, does OSF provide a possible GDPR compliant storage research data um, on local servers, including the EU? Uh, this is a great one. So this actually comes into play when you're creating a, well, one, when you're creating a new project, but also you have the right to be forgotten, which is GDPR. Um, so as far as when you're creating a project on the OSF, you have the option to choose a storage location. Um, I'm a little worried on creating a project right now because it may take a little bit of work um, and our site's a little bit slow when it comes to test site. Um, but when you're creating a project, you have the option of choosing a storage location. Now we give uh, four different storage locations that offer kind of the broad needs that you would need to do. Um, so especially for the EU, you would select a the country or region that is within the EU. That helps with the GDPR um, compliance as far as storing your data, but you also have the right to be forgotten. So say five, 10 years down the road, you want, to completely rework and you want to say, I want to lower my, my, uh, my visibility online. You have the right to be forgotten. So what you could do is you could write in to the OSF support saying, I would like to delete my information using the GDPR compliance. We will go through and we will GDPR delete your account, which will remove you from um, our system as far as the GDPR compliance. Uh, keep scrolling through. After the pre-registration pre phase, is there a formal registration phase to complete? Um, now, Eric or Mark did a pretty good job of answering this. Um, a pre-registration is a really great start for when you are creating a registration, but it's a great way of showing what your plan is. Um, the difference between a pre-registration and a registration really occurs when you're doing it. Um, a pre-registration 
broad terms, ha happens before you've even collected any data at all. Whereas a registration, it really happens before you've actually analyzed any of the data at all. Uh, that line gets a little bit blurred depending on where you are or who's defining these different terms. Um, but as far as pre-registration or a registration, uh, depending on where you are and what your requirements are, you're going to either go with a pre-registration or a registration. Um, and typically, you don't have to go back and create a registration if you've already created a pre-registration. What recommendations do you have for uploading a preprint, um, then sending the manuscript for a peer reviewed journal? Is it possible to upload in a non? Oh, we already talked about that one. We actually have quite a few questions here. Um, Uh, will you be sharing the recording with us? Yes, um, that is hopefully the goal of this webinar and make sure that everybody has the information that we need. Uh, we do have a future question here. Um, so I see someone says, uh, does OS have support connection with Google Earth engines? Um, we, as Eric said here, we don't currently have a connection with Google Earth. Uh, this is kind of the point of interacting with audiences like this. We get a new ideas. Um, so if Google Earth Engine is something that your research team finds invaluable and you use it every day and you need it, let us know. Uh, we're always looking for new features. We're always looking for new ideas to help support and make the OSF really help you as researchers. Uh, how is this free? Uh, what about the cloud storage? Uh, doesn't that cost someone? Yes, uh, so the OSF is free. Um, we are predominantly funded through uh, grants and some of our paid services, uh, but it's free. Uh, that's especially for um, researchers like yourself. Uh, the idea is that uh, we want to be able to provide and lower the barriers for people to share their research easily and openly and transparently and follow these practices. Um, uh, OSF is also supported by some of our great partners um, like OSF institution members, uh, some of our community oriented uh, registries, all sorts of different people who are really looking to make sure that open and transparent practices are become a commonplace within the entire research life cycle. And scientific community. Uh, can view only link, links be restricted in time? Uh, not necessarily, but they can be removed. Um, so going back to our view only link that we created, I can get rid of this view only link at any time. That would make this link that I have sent out no longer work. Um, so if say I only wanted to give these people reviewing my project a certain amount of time, um, you can actually go through and remove this link. Uh, yeah, and then if you have removed this, uh, it'll be taking you back to what this project page normally would be. So if I remove that the only link, that link will still work, but it'll take it to a private page, something that they can't see. Or if it's a public link, it'll actually take it to the full public link where it won't be anonymized anymore. Um, they'll be able to see that this is a project created by Sophia and myself. Uh, da, da, da. Scrolling through. And if you go hey, back Daniel. to the first couple at the top. Yeah, of the, the first person. two. Yeah, the first two questions are pretty good. Uh, is that the one on the coverage of literature? Uh, yeah, coverage of the literature. Um, and then another one about sharing ideas with collaborators who aren't registered on CloudSoft. Uh, I'm having a hard time finding it. Um, okay, uh, so what does the OSF cover coverage on literature? Um, well, that's also part of our, uh, 
I think this is the way that you guys took it. Uh, um, yes. Uh, so something that we didn't really talk about very much in the videos is our client base or how many users we actually have on the OSF. Um, so when I'm searching through the OSF here, I'm actually going to be looking through the work and the public work of our users and our user base recently, and we'll send out an announcement soon, has hit 500,000 users depositing hundreds and thousands of registrations, preprints, and files. All that material that's publicly available is available to you. So when you're searching through, you know, um, I'm going to type in bacteria. Again, um, when I'm searching through bacteria on the OSF, I'm looking through all of the results from those public projects. Um, I'm looking at all the files that have bacteria as a keyword. Um, I'm having all the projects, all the preprints, all the registrations, and all the components that come in. Um, now, it's different depending on what you're actually searching for and if your key terms actually hit these things as all search and discovery phases work, but you're able to search through quite a few different projects. Now, uh, we're able to go through, say, our preprint service, and this actually connects to our share um, our share database where you're actually able to search through quite a few different uh, preprint providers as well. So if you are going through and say you want to look through, does BioArchive have anything on this particular topic? I'm able to actually search through that as well using Share, which is a shared platform um, between all these preprint providers. I think that kind of covered, yeah, Share aggregates results of the preprint services. Um, love this platform and want to know if it's possible to share ideas with collaborators who are not registered members on the OSF. This is a fantastic question. So somebody who's on the OSF that doesn't, or this was a really easy demonstration for, um, especially for Sophia, when she's trying to add a collaborator, she's adding me. I'm on the, I'm on the OSF. I work for the OSF. Um, but I can also add collaborators to a project who may not actually be on the OSF. Uh, those people are called uh, unregistered contributors. So say I add, I'm going to just add, this is not a person in our group and they're not on our test site. Uh, what I'm going to do is I can add this person, Courtney Smith, as an unregistered contributor. Um, what that does is I am able to, one, I could invite them by sending an email address to them. Um, I'm just going to put this as my other email address. or whatever. Um, and what this will do is it will send an email to this person. Now, this person has the choice of joining the OSF or they could not, but their name will still be associated with this project. Um, uh, Gmail. And I can click add. Uh, choose the permission level, uh, read and write. So if I go back to this project here, Courtney Smith is on here, but you'll also notice that she is not hyperlinked. So if I click on my name, you would take it to my personal OSF profile, whereas Courtney Smith hasn't claimed that profile. Now they have the option of claiming that profile via the email that was sent to them, or they can go to this project, click on this link and say, is this you? Uh, and they can claim that profile that way but uh, they will be cited both in the citation section for the project, uh, but also in the uh, contributor section. Now this can be done, especially, um, this could also be done when you are creating a registration. So this registration has been submitted, it's archived. Um, so I can't add a contributor right now, but when I was creating this registration, you can add a unregistered contributor to a registration. Um, I think we're getting to the end here of our questions. 
I'm not seeing anything else come in. Uh, product team, did you see anything else for uh, questions that might need to be addressed or talked about? Uh, I didn't see anything else. Okay. Um, well, I will end our webinar kind of the same way that we began. Uh, this was a webinar designed for you. Uh, this was a webinar designed uh, with researchers in mind, and that's essentially how the OSF is designed. Uh, every change that we make has researchers and researchers intent in mind. Uh, so if you do ever have any ideas or ways that we can make the OSF better, or even questions on how to actually go through these things, our door is always open. Um, so feel free to email uh, OSF support if you have any questions, which will be taken to one of uh, our very trained staff who can help you out with these questions. Uh, but also feel free to reach out. We're always interested in chatting and talking about the OSF and how to make it better for you. Uh, with that, thank you guys. Uh, let me know if you have any questions or anything comes up. All right. Thank you.